Can you hear me now? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I should have sound now. Um, yeah, there's a couple of seconds delay between questions coming through. So I'm still seeing people saying no sound. Yes, ah, brilliant, great stuff. Yeah, that was just because I had done one the other night where I needed no sound, <laughs> bizarrely enough. So, right, let's get to the beginning. Um, so just um, just before I start, I see um, Krista there has said that there are spammers in full, full force here. So if you do see uh, anybody putting links into the comments, um, don't click on those links. You know the uh, the, the only person is would be is if if Krista does it or if sort of Camera World does it. Um, if there's any sort of any products that we come through, so you you make sure you don't click on any links. That's one of the uh, the downsides to doing these Facebook lives. But um, other than that, um, I will introduce myself. So my name is uh, my name is Oliver Wright, um, and I am going to talk to you for the next hour about macro photography. I have got quite a sort of it's quite a long, there's quite a lot of slides here, so I'm going to have to go through quite quickly. Um, so uh, big thanks to Camera World um, and to Canon uh, for support in this event. Um, and let's let's start. So just to give you a quick bit of um, um, short history from me, because some of you um, some of you may have uh, been to talks that I've done before in the past, but some of you may not. Um, I've been doing photography for, for some time now. Uh, originally, it was all about sort of climbing and taking pictures on holiday. Um, and then I did a trip to South America and that made me buy an SLR. Um, and they had that out of focus uh, blue footed booby was the uh, precursor to that. Um, and then I had my SLR for maybe three years, had it in auto mode. And then I had a climbing accident in 2010, bust my leg up really badly. Um, but that gave me the opportunity to sort of have more time um, because I wasn't climbing for, for some years um, and it got me out learning how to use the camera properly. Um, and then I, I was still working full time in the corporate world then, but that sort of led me to leave the corporate world and sort of just spend all my time as a, as, as, as a photographer. So, and then me now, well, sort of normally when we're sort of not locked down, um, I tend to spend my summers in the UK um, and other countries where possible. Um, doing a lot of macro photography as well as other types of photography and then I have been working for the last seven years during the winter um, uh, for a company called Lights Over Lapland in a tiny little village in the very northwest of Sweden um, working as a working as a guide and taking people out to photograph the northern lights and um, arctic landscapes and that really is me in a frozen lake at about minus 18 um, and because this is going to be quite an instructional video, this one, um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna do a little disclaimer, um, because often there's more than one way to get to the same result, and and that really is true with macro photography. And everybody sort of has their their own techniques. I mean, I'm gonna talk you through um, my evolution of um, uh, macro photography. Um, um, and every, everybody should always be learning as well. I know I, know I am. And I, I always say this, often things aren't black and white. And some of the things I'm going to say to you, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to contradict as well. Um, <laughs> just in, it, 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 the way it is with macro photography. And some, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about sort of... Um, sort of high magnification handheld stacking as well and you know so, some of those things are not going to suit everybody um now i can't see questions coming through now let's have a okay it might be just nobody yeah okay i'll keep cracking so uh, my evolution of macro because uh, yeah I've, I've been doing uh, macro was one of the first types of uh, photography that really grabbed me um, and it you know it's been a real sort of driving force of mine through through my years of doing photography but it, it, it's really really changed how I've done macro photography over the time so when I first started it out I started handheld um, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't really use a tripod at all at that, that point, but I used to use flash all the time. 
Um, and then I found that I didn't really like Flash because of what it did to colours, the reflections, etc. Um, and we'll cover that in more detail. I, I then had a sort of moment of truth and learned about early mornings. So I do a lot of my macro photography uh, very early on the morning. You know, I'll head out before the sun comes up and we'll see why as we go through. Um, but then while I was doing that, because I was photographing things which were torpid and not moving around much, um, I learned that actually a tripod is really useful in those type of situations. Um, somewhere along there as well, I, I learned how to stack images and nearly all of my macro shots are stacked, but not all of them. Um, and then I learned how to sort of take the stack into um, um, doing it handheld. And then I sort of learned how somewhere along the lines, how to sort of do really high magnification handheld stacking. So um, we're gonna we're gonna cover that off as well, uh, because all of these things come with their um, their own challenges. So some simple rules with macro, which are, are, are really worth understanding, um, because I think this is, you know, sometimes macro photography is sort of seen as a quite a difficult sort of element of photography. And uh, some photographers who I speak to who sort of just start out with macro, they, uh, you know, they quite often feel they're not getting the results that they expected to get. Um, now, there's, there's, there's reasons for this, um, and one of the key reasons for this is when you're doing photography, um, the closer you get to your subject, um, so, you know, here's a macro lens, uh, the MPE 65, um, and with this lens you have to get really close to the subject, then the shallower you, or the smaller your doff, yeah. so doff is depth, depth of field, so how much of the image is in focus. Um, so when you're doing macro photography, you're really, really close to the subject. So your depth of field, I mean, with this lens here, um, it, it, you know, if, if I wind it out to five times magnification, because this lens does allow you to do that, um, the depth of field is, is just a sliver of a millimetre. So only a tiny bit of the subject is in focus. So this image on the right wouldn't be possible in a single photograph. And... The more you move your lens away from the sensor, like I just have done with this MPE, um, or another way would be is if I put extension tubes onto the lens and move the lens further away from the sensor, then that reduces your minimum focusing distance, i.e. it makes the subject even closer to the front of the camera, um, which magnifies the image. Um, but also causes you some other issues because less light gets to the sensor, um, and it also ends up reducing your depth of field even further. And the more magnified the image is, um, i.e. by um, adding um, extension tubes, etc., or using a specialist lens like this, um, then all your issues sort of get more magnified as well. So any camera wobble, um, that, 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 I mean, that's your key one really, or anything moving on an insect, all of that gets more magnified as well. Um, so in summary, um, the more you magnify things, which is often what you're wanting to do with macro photography, you know, the more difficult it becomes. So, it, you know, that it's, it, it's just sort of a key thing to get your head around with, with macro photography. So I'm just going to sort of cover a few older images, which are, are all sort of favourites of mine, um, but just sort of talk through them a little bit in terms of how that helped me sort of develop the way I do things now. So, I mean, here I've got um, I've got an adult male jumping spider where I'm just about to eat a little um, garden orb spiderling. I found this little patch of garden orb spiders and this, this guy was just running in and, and gobbling them all up. Um, now this image, this so here I would have taken this at about f13, so a tiny aperture to give me a bigger depth of field. Um, but you know I've still only really got the uh, the spiderlings in focus and part of the uh, the bigger zebra jumping spiders in focus. Um, but even at f14, you know I, I I could have done with a slightly bigger depth of field to get more more of the front of the legs in focus, etc. And also, you, you'll notice I've got the uh, the flash reflections in the eye there, and uh, you know a, a couple of the highlights have blown out. So these these were the things which started me thinking I wanted to move away from flash. 
Uh, here I've got a, a robber fly, um, again, so I, I would have shot this at something like F9 to F14. And the flash really does bring the uh, robber fly's eyes um, um, out and bright, and the contrast is great. Um, but I haven't got any of the antennae eyes in focus. You know, the, um, I would have liked to have had these front legs in focus. Got a little bit of flash glare on the legs. Um, but the real issue here is, is the fact that because I'm using flash and that's not hitting the background, um, I've got big flash drop off there so even though this is taken during the day um, it, it sort of looks like it would have been taken at night time hi there camera world yeah, sorry you're uh, yeah sorry we, you're getting distracted by spammers and yeah just anybody anybody who sees any sort of dodgy links that isn't by camera world don't 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 click on them okay so here's a, a, one of my favourite subjects, um, this, this species of jumping spider. Um, so here I actually had moved on to natural light, so I haven't got the flash glare there. Um, but it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a crop, was this one. And, and you can see clearly I've got the eyes pretty much in focus. Um, but, the, you know, the, 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 this front leg's totally not in focus. And I, I would have really liked that to have been in focus, ideally. Um, this nice ladybird, um, I've got the focus right, um, but you can see here where, where it's got a shiny shell. Um, really, we've got a, a lot of flash glare there again. So again, what, what led me away from that? And here, the, uh, this is uh, still one of my favourite macro photographs. Uh, so this is a spider hunting wasp, which has uh, predated, a, uh, predated a really quite large spider. Uh, and this, I, believe it or not, I just took this in Yorkshire. Um, and th these wasps, yeah, you think spiders may be fearsome predators, um, but this species of wasp, I think there's, there's quite a few different species in the UK, uh, will sting the spider, uh, paralyze it, and then it will drag it into an underground lair and um, lay eggs inside it, which uh, hatch, uh, eat the spider from the, eat the paralyzed spider alive, um, and then hatch out and make more of these wasps. Pretty, pretty vicious life cycle. So what is stacking? Because you've heard me mention it a few times. So here I am going to uh, going to take you through just a, a quick little story. I've been to visit a friend of mine, Tim Parkin, who uh, lives up in Scotland, and uh, he was like, "I don't understand how you can um, how, how how you can do this sort of handheld stacking on on things that move." Um, and I was like, well, does your cat move, Tim? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, but does it stay still for a second? Um, and he's like, uh, well, yeah, yeah, it might, might do. So we're in his kitchen. Um, I had my camera set up on the high speed continuous and I just fired a burst while I've got the focus system turned off, move backwards and forwards till I see the tip of the nose in focus. And I move towards the cat. So there's eight shots out of maybe a sequence of about 20. Um, and then I have stacked, you can see though, you know, I, the depth of field is very, very thin. I'm doing this with a, with a macro lens on. Um, and then there's a stacked version. And I've got all the way from the nose to the, uh, the first eye in focus. But we haven't got any um, sort of flash reflections there. You can see his window reflected. You can see my hands and the camera reflected. But everything's sort of a, a, a lot more natural. So that's what I, that's what I mean by, by stacking. So Chris Hunt has asked a good question. How do you get so close without spooking them? So I, uh, there's two, two elements. One is either out really early in the morning when the insects are torpid. So you're going to see a whole section on that. Um, but the, the other piece is, is just patience, really. Um, watching the insect, looking at its behaviour. Because um, things like jumping spiders, etc., they are quite skittish. But if you're very slow, um, methodical, don't do fast movements, and you watch them and wait for them to pause, that's that, that's when I would take the pictures. But I don't, you know, don't move fast towards them. I make sure I'm hidden behind the camera as much as possible. Um, and that's the key. This bit I'm going to go through quite quickly, but just to let you know that the stacking technique as well, um, I use in a variety of different situations. So here I've used it on a, an architectural shop, um, Heel Staircase in London. Um, here I've used it on some aurora photography, um, yeah, because I wanted the ice as much as the icicles. I, I could have done with more of the icicles in focus, to be fair, and I wanted the aurora to be in focus too. Um, here, you know, I wanted this icy block to be in focus, um, uh, Laporte in the background, and these red lenticular clouds. 
And here I'd been out with a friend. Um, I was doing some photography. She was running. She came back with these frosty eyelashes. And I'm like, oh, oh God, I could get, try and get a shot of um, Laporte on that big U-shaped mountain in the previous image. Um, I could get that reflected in her eye um, and all those frosty, frosty lashes. So again, I've not done that as a handheld stack. So, um, Dave, Amber, do you move towards or away from the subject when bird shooting? Uh, you, you can do either. Either would work. I do move um, forwards. I'm going to show you some little video clips later on. Um, but, yeah, when it's these really small subjects, I, I'm just moving forward really slowly. But I'm going to show you a quick video of me both doing the tripod stacking and the non-tripod stacking as well. Uh, so that, 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 that should help. So why stack? You know, why not just use a smaller aperture? Um, but like I showed you in those um, in those previous um, um, images, sometimes even f14 is not going to be enough to get the whole subject in, in, in focus. You've also got the impact of flash I've spoken about. Um, but also this is a key one for me. Is So here I've got um, a, a dragonfly which has just come out of its exuvia. You know, this subject I have to be really careful with. You know, if, if I try touching that stem, um, the dragonfly is going to fall off. It's not it's not dried out yet. I'm going to kill a dragonfly. I really don't want to do that. So I'm going to photograph it completely in situ. And it's surrounded by reeds. If I try to photograph that at F14, all of those reeds would be really obvious in the image. But here, doing it with a wide aperture, um, uh, the, that background just sort of blurs out really nicely and I don't put the dragonfly under any risk. Um, also, if, if you know, if, if photographing something like this, I've got to work really quickly. There is going to be a little bit of movement with, with breeze, etc. If I tried um, using a smaller aperture, you know, I'm, I might be at half a second exposure, etc. Again, that's not going to work. So, but if I'm shooting at f4, I can get much faster shutter speed, which is going to make things work a lot better. So, tripod or no tripod? So, when would I use a tripod? I'd do it with critters that don't move. So, that would often lead me to early mornings or late evenings when things are roosting. Um, yeah, when I can get the camera into the right place as well, sometimes things are going to be in a spot where I can't even use a tripod. Um, and when there's no wind as well, you know, if it's really windy, I would tend to be photographing more on, uh, you're going to see this actually in one of the videos, I'd be photo photographing on fences, etc. and things that aren't moving in the wind. Um, but tripods do solve a lot of macro challenges. You know, I can get away with slower shutter speeds. I can control the movement a lot better because I like may have a, a, a macro rail. Um, here's a macro rail on top of a tripod. You're going to see that in the video. Um, so, yeah, using a tripod does make things a lot easier. But so then when would I not use a tripod? Um, you know, skittish critters. Things like jumping spiders, ruby-tailed wasps, which are moving around. If I, you know, by the time I set up a tripod, it's going to have moved. Um, you know, when things are in a tricky spot, uh, yeah, you know, I found sort of nice ice crystals, sort of up in places where I, yeah, I just couldn't possibly get a tripod. And, and also when time is of the essence. So something like the um, that spider hunting the wasp, etc. Um, you know. I, I, I saw it, I, you know, I've just got a couple of seconds to get the shot before the thing's going to move away. Um, but if there's enough light, things are moving and they're interesting, I may still use a flash as well, and we're going to see some ex examples of that. Tripod stacking and how. So, um, like I said, so I would... Um, I would often use a focus rail. Um, I nearly always use a focus rail now, but if you don't have a focus rail or you just haven't got it with you, you can just move the focus ring as well. Um, although you, you are going to get focus breathing if you move the focus ring because the image is going to get a little bit smaller or bigger depending on which way you move the focus ring. But that is a way of um, moving, the, um, move, moving the plane of focus. Um, and now on a lot of these, um, on a lot of the modern cameras, um, you, um, uh, you do have this focus bracketing as well. Um, and last week when I did a talk, um, I did cover off a little bit of uh, Im images of birds that I've stacked because I've been using the focus bracketing. Um, so focus bracketing can be really, really good. Um, Barry, good question. Does in-camera focus bracketing remove the need for a focus rail? Um, 
it can do in certain situations but then a lot of the a lot of the time i'm using this mpe 65 mil canon lens which is my go-to lens if i'm photographing uh, things uh, really small things and i want them high magnification now this lens has a fixed focal point and there's no focus system in it and therefore i can't use focus bracketing so focus bracketing is only available if you're using a modern camera like this this canon r5 um, and you're using a lens which has a focus system um, they say, where can you find jumping spiders? And is there a good time of year? Um, absolutely. So jumping spiders are starting to come out now. Um, but they um, it's gone a little bit cold here in Leeds to see jumping spiders at the moment. But as soon as it starts getting up to about 10 degrees, you can start finding them. Um, zebra jumping spiders are the ones you can find most often. What The best place to look for them is south-facing walls and fences, which are getting sunlight. Um, yeah, would be would be best. Um, so whoop, jumping back over here, so tripod stacking and how. So if I'm doing tripod stacking, I would turn stabilization off on the camera and the lens, um, just because stabilization will sort of fight with, uh, can fight with the tripod a little bit. Um, I'm going to be using live view um, because that gives you know it means I can just sort of sit there um, and see what's happening. Um, I would tend to use a remote release as well, just because if we're high magnification and I'm, I'm hitting the shutter button, I am going to induce a little bit of shake there. So I, I use a remote release when I'm doing this. Now, the trickiest thing, um, especially when I'm doing high magnification stuff, is just getting the tripod in place. Um, because, you know, I look at the subject, think about what composition I want, and... Um, and then if I'm shooting at like four times magnification, just a tiny little bit of movement, um, it completely alters the composition. So you'll see when I put the video on, um, getting the camera into the right place is, is, is the most tricky thing. Um, and if it's windy as well and I'm tripod stacking, that can also be tricky. But what I do use is this thing called a Wimbley clamp. It plimp, cl <laughs> clamps onto my tripod um, and then it has these jaws with foam in, and I just stabilise the um, I just stabilise the blade of grass or whatever. Um, it doesn't damage it because it, it's got this foam in there, and that allows me to get away with more wind. Um, but I really take time on the composition because the composition is everything. Uh, oh, more questions here. Uh, so, do you ever use a lens hood for macro? Um, I, to be honest, I, I I just leave it off um, when when I'm doing macro. Um, there may be times when I do use it if I'm shooting towards the sun, um, but those type of shots are generally not as close anyway. Um, when not using a macro rail but a tripod, do you use manual focus? Um, yes, generally, yeah, yeah, unless I'm doing the, um, unless I'm doing the focus bracketing. Uh, lots of questions about focus bracketing. Uh, another one off David. Um, no, if, if I'm... Um, if I'm using a focus bracketing, I'm, I'm generally not using the rail. So I'm going to show you a quick little video. I am going to sort of skip it forward a little bit um, at times because it's 25 minutes long and that is uh, too long. Um, but this was taken. Um, this was taken with um, me getting to a site. A robber fly, which is just here. So you don't have to see that, it's just on a piece of grass. So um, I didn't even unpack the camera bag, I thought I'd sort of show you. So that sort of shows you where the uh, the robber fly is. Um, I'm this video is on my YouTube as well. So if you want to watch the whole thing, because I, I, I go into it in quite a lot of detail, just, just come and find me on YouTube. Um, I'm just going to skip forward to. There's me putting the clamp on. I'm going to skip forward to sort of here just to sort of show you the difficulty on sort of so getting the tripod into the right place. Tripod, getting it to roughly the right height. So I want to do this and be as 
Now, this bit literally takes me about five minutes. Um, it really is the most fiddly bit. But I right, on the back of the camera. Um, tripod, clamp. See if you go right in here. And there's a robber fly. So, right, let's bang this back over here. So that gives you an idea of the setup, and then I'm just going to show you what I do when I'm doing the actual stack. Basically now, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put my finger in front of the lens, fire a blank, so I know where the stack begins. Um, I'm going to move, use the um, macro rail just to bring the camera back into position. So I just go backwards and forwards till I get the, the frontmost part of the image in focus I want. Take a shot. Move the uh, camera forward tiny bit, take a shot. And just rinse and repeat. Till I have everything in focus. And that literally is it guys. It's, it, it's as simple as that. Um, and I mean, on this video, I, I go through the whole uh, post-production bit as well. So again, if that was something you wanted to have a look at, and, and, and that's what the robber fly looks like at the end. Um, so it, in some ways, it, it really is quite a simple, simple process. Um, I'm just going to go through a number of different examples of stuff I have photographed using that technique. Um, and you can sort of see the difference between that, that, that older work um, so like here on this ladybird, um, there's no flash um, re uh, reflected at all um, and you've actually got sort of refractions of the, uh, the grass which is behind on some of the water drops and then on some of the other water drops you've got, got a reflection of the, uh, the sky and the trees so it gets much more, much more natural. Um, oh, got more questions here. How much are you turning the ra rail wheel please? Um, on a tiny, tiny fractions. So, I mean, and the smaller the subject, the smaller I am moving the, um, I am moving that dial as well. So if I'm right up to five times magnification or beyond, I'm almost moving the, uh, moving it imperceptibly. So just a tiny little, tiny little bit. So Ingrid, by the time your setup, wouldn't the inset be long gone? Not if you're out there first thing in the morning. So, um, you know, those insects need a little bit of heat and warmth before they move. You photograph them first thing in the morning and you have a, a period of time where they're, they're going to stay torpid. Uh, this is great. Loads of questions. Uh, what camera settings would you use? It's very specific. So I would use a shutter speed, which is going to be appropriate for the day, depending on how much wind there is. So, I mean, if there's no wind, you know, and the tripod's very sturdy and the subject's not moving, I can, you know, I can get away with quite slow shutter speeds. If there's a little bit of wind moving the grass, I'm going to have to use a fast, faster shutter speed. So this, it, it to, it's totally situational. Um, but I'm generally going to be shooting at about F, f4 around that and i'm generally going to be using about iso 1600 now if if um that they're probably going to get me to the shutter speeds that i need but it's going to depend on how bright the morning is what the cloud covers like and how much wind there is but that would be about my starting point so okay, do you use reflectors i i very rarely use reflectors um but I, I know quite a few people do, uh, but I very rarely use them. So these were uh, these were some wool spiders that I found on my garden fence, just about four meters over that direction. Um, great little critters. So these I used a tripod. Um, I used the MPE 65, um, and I also used a full set of extension tubes as well. So we got to here, we're up to about seven seven times magnification. Um, and you can, again, you know, you can see my house and the lens and some ivy reflected in the spider's eyes. Um, manual of it, Ivy, always manual, always manual. Um, Joyce, do you ever put insects in the fridge to calm them down or is that unethical? Yeah, I, I, from my view, I mean, everybody has their different views. I, 
I, I don't I don't touch the insects. I don't um, I don't spray them with anything. I only photograph them in situ. So that that's not something I I, I would ever do. Um, I better move off the spiders because Kath says she's not going to sleep very well tonight. <laughs> um, how many images did I take in total in that video? Uh, again, it's sort of quite situational. I, I probably took about twenty in that video. Um, but on a subject like this one I've got here, this robber fly. Um, I, I again was maybe about 10 but I will tend to probably take um, more than I need and then when I back it back back at home on, on the computer I would you know I would then pick pick out of there what I need but it's better to have too many than too little so this robber fly here I mean if I compare that one to the one that I've done in the past so you know the the one in the past where it's single shot and handheld this one on the bottom I've got a much bigger depth of field much more of a robber fly um is is is, is in focus also the colors are very different it's a lot more natural and I've not got that flash drop off so yeah just that compare and contrast between how things how things have changed but here, um, these, this was ants taken at five times magnification. They wouldn't stop moving. So I both used a tripod and a flash and they're just single, single images. Um, but it was um, some ants in my back garden and they were taking, um, they were taking nectar from aphids. So I, yeah, I, I, I wanted to capture it, so I used a flash. And, and here, these next set of images, yeah, this is what you can get when you go out and you do early mornings. Um, uh, the um, basically the, uh, the the sort of the really nice early mornings are when you can find insects covered in dew. So, like I said, I I I'd never spray these. Um, if I find them covered in dew, um, then you know, then that's brilliant. Um, so for dewy mornings, what I look out for um, is you, it has to be mornings with virtually no no wind. Um, because if there's wind that that doesn't allow the dew to form um, and you want to be looking for days when it's been really warm during the day um, the ground is sort of quite wet and then this this creates humidity and then nights which are cold and then basically the, the, the dew the dew can form on insects but if you can find insects which are covered in dew you know they're going to be really torpid because they're cold um, and the dew can make really really fun you know it can really make images come to life um, and I, I, I sort of said I only use a tripod um, in, in the morning but that's not quite true sometimes I can find subjects like uh, like these guys these this it's just this one species of robber fly I know um, but for whatever reason they're just really not bothered. Um, they will, um, you know, they, they will not, they, they won't move. They just, um, this rock, this type of robber fly, they're not bothered you there. I mean, here I'm doing five times magnification shots of them and they're just happy to sit still. They're, they're a really bizarre species, but they, uh, they're, a, they're a phenomenal looking insect for doing, uh, doing macro photography. And then sometimes, like this one, um, this was with a tripod and it was just a single image. So, you know, I'm not stacking all of the time. Um, um, this one was actually taken, I know, no, this, this, this was early doors because the, the light is just coming through the trees. Um, but a, a, another whole thing to think about is, is light and how you sort of position yourselves. But I, I've, I've, only, I've only got so much time today, so I'm, I'm going through quite a lot of material here pr pretty, pretty quickly. I had to sh I had to sort of show you this one. So this was um, a meadow brown, I think, um, completely covered in dew. Um, so it was um, early morning again. But sometimes I found with insects, they uh, they do wake up. Um, so I have learned now that if I see that happening, um, I just um, flick the camera onto movie mode and do a movie clip. But I didn't know that. Um, I didn't realise a meadow brown did this. So pretty, pretty crazy. So um, it it was basically trying to take the um, dew drops um, off its eyes. Nigel, the name of a pl that that clamp is a, a Wimberley clamp. Um, uh, so. 
I'm going to move on to the other section now. So yeah, I do all of this stuff with tripods, but then I also do a lot of um, handheld stacking. So I'm doing stacking, but I'm um, I'm not using a tripod. So again, I'm going to show you a, a quick bit of a video, um, which shows shows me doing that style. I did demonstrate this for Camera World before as well. Um, on a previous video so you could see that video from last year and it go into a little bit more detail but in some ways it, this is really simple because you just need a camera and a lens you don't need any other equipment um, but then on the other side it's probably the most difficult style of photography I've done um, it, and it's it's all about how you stabilize yourself and you're going to see that in the video um, and I would say if you get into tr doing this you just need to practice 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 um, you know, it's it, it is quite it is quite tricky. I, I'm going to make it look quite easy in this vi video, but it, it does take quite a lot of practice. And the settings you would use on this is all factored in about getting enough shutter speed. Because if you're hand holding macro lenses, you know you need a fairly quick shutter speed to um, uh, to, to to get fast enough shutter speed, so you're not getting camera shake. So this one, I would turn stabilization on. Um, I'd be shooting in manual again and um, I would be using high speed continuous um, I tend to always shoot in raw but you might want to shoot in JPEG for this because it's sort of quicker on your camera um, and a another key thing is you need to sort of watch the subject watch what they're doing and pick the time when they pause and again think about the composition uh, more questions pulled in here so this lens is the Canon MPE 65 um, and my other go-to lens is the Canon 100mm macro. This one I also use um, a lot. Uh, Dave, do I recommend Raynox adapters over extension tubes? They're not something that I would ever use. Um, I, just because I, I, I'm sort of set up with these two lenses and extension tubes. Um, but I have heard of uh, people, people do using them. Uh, what would I class as a high shutter speed? You know, if you can get to like a 200th of a second, that's going to be good. Um, but the higher magnification, the higher the shutter speed you need. So I'm going to quickly move on to this video. Ah, well, I am in a second. So this is what I'm, this is a good example of uh, sort of a high magnification stack. So this little jumping spider, probably at about three and a half times, um, four times uh, magnification. Um, but you can see I've got a lot more detail here on the jumping spider. And I've actually got the clouds in the sky and my hand and lens reflected in the jumping spider's eye. Now we're on a video. <laughs> so again, I am going to skip forward a little bit just so you see the technique bit here. Now, you will notice in this video, it's really, really windy. So when it's really windy, one way of getting around that wind is to photograph things on, on fences. And if you're photographing them at high speed, um, if you're photographing them at high magnification, um, you, you know, uh, you're not even going to really be able to tell that it's on a fence because you'll, you'll see the images I come out with. Um, and also here as well, I've put a little bit of diffusion um, paper over the front of the lens and that was because it was a really sunny day but I don't often use that technique uh, right let me just yeah so there's a horse fly there's two there and let the video go right so I've got the subject in view And that's it. That, that's what you do. Again, it's really quite a simple technique. Um, but the things you've got to look out for is you, 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 you'll, I'll, I'll play another section of this as well. Um, I'm stabilizing the camera by pushing on the front and pushing on the back. And that's what's making the camera stable. So I'll, I'll always be trying to get elbows on things and hands on things to, um, to, to rest. Uh, David has said that's not the R5. That is correct. Um, this video was done before the um, R5 came out. That was the uh, 5D Mark IV um, I was using using in that video. So let me just 
zip it on to another section. But one thing you'll notice is I barely, you know, because this subject is so small, I'm probably only moving about a, a millimeter and a half over a number of shots. So it almost looks like I'm not moving at all. And that's it, that, that is the technique that I use. Um, so and these are the these are the images that I was getting from there. So even though they're on a fence, get some pretty striking uh, images of these horseflies. I was being quite brave photographing horseflies in on a hot day with a vest on. Um, <laughs> but horseflies have these absolutely amazing eyes. Uh, so I do, even though you do run the risk of them uh, giving you a little nip, um, I do like to photograph them. And, and sometimes as well, if you're going to be doing this handheld stacking, you need to be prepared to get into some sort of, you know, quite awkward positions. So here I'd, I'd been um, I'd been running a workshop with uh, Lizzie Shepherd up in the Dales, um, and we'd been covering sort of landscape and nature um, and I, I'd been getting a lot of questions about sort of stacking but it was sort of quite a windy day and I hadn't really seen any um, interesting subjects on that day and we got back to the car this is my car um, in fact you can see Lizzie Shepherd reflected in the car um, and I saw this jumping spider uh, um, on the door and um, so I thought well right I'll, I'll, I'll give everybody a quick sort of demonstration of how to do a handheld stack so um the spider was facing down though, so literally I had to lie on the floor and shoot up to get this image. So you can sort of see me reflected in the in the lens there. You can see I've got a bigger depth of field with the spider. Um, but that was the position that I had to, to get into. Jennifer, what was the white thing on the lens? That was, it was just a little bit of diffusion paper, almost like baking paper, just to take some of the glare away from the sun. Um, I, I, I only use that on really bright sunny days um, where I can't sort of photograph things in shade. This one I am going to skip because we're running a little bit low on time. Um, but again, uh, it's just showing you exactly that same technique and the video is on my, is on my YouTube as well. Um, but jumping spiders, such a great subject to photograph. Um, and this can be a good time to photograph them as well when they've um, when they've predated something because they'll be a little bit more um, they can be a little bit more settled. Another jumping spider here, and same species that I showed you at the beginning, but again you can see there the depth of field is much bigger because I have uh, I have stacked through it. Um, so you get quite quite a di you see quite a difference on 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 the two images. And one thing you do need to do on this, uh, and I mean, a number of you have said, you know, how do you get close to insects? Ruby-tailed wasps was something I really wanted to photograph. So ruby-tailed wasps are something which start to come out a little bit later in the year. So they will, um, they, they tend to start coming out in June when things get warmer. Um, and uh, they are just this most amazing looking insect. Um, but they are so skittish. Um, they are very, um, they're very tiny and they move about very fast. So it, it became a bit of a mission of mine to sort of try and get a, a, a high sort of magnification handheld stack of a, a ruby tailed wasp. And for, for quite some time, this is sort of what they look like. Um, yeah, just capturing the thing flying away. Uh, what size is a jumping spider? Our UK jumping spiders are pretty small. Um, they're generally about sort of half the size of my fingernail if it's a big one. Um, I a little fingernail. Um, yeah, you know they're they're they're, they're pretty small. Um, and and all uh, nearly all spiders have eight eyes. Um, so yeah, here's another example of one of my uh, early um, attempts at handheld stacking ruby tail wasps. Um, but and the first year I managed to get it, I got this one where the stack hadn't quite worked and it's not all in focus, but I was getting there. And then after a couple of years, um, I managed to do it. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is this type of photography can take a lot of patience. Um, 
but these ruby tail wasps if you can photograph them you know they, they're really awesome looking looking creatures and um, these are generally about sort of six millimeters long as well so that you know again they're not very big um but yeah boy do they um they're, they're really interesting to photograph and that iridescence color um if you can get them in natural light and this one's a like a, a similar species but it, it doesn't have a ruby tail um but it's just like I, I didn't even know we had wasps that looked like this in this country till i started getting into macro photography and you know we just to talk about a calendar of things coming out at this moment there's not that many macro subjects out there so flies are starting to come out now um you know some shield bugs um, a couple of butterfly species are starting to come out um, but the, uh, soon we're going to have a um, soon we'll be having dragonflies and damselflies will start coming out um, as we get into May but more of those species start coming out in, in into June and then you know by the time we're into June we should start having robber flies um, most of the most of the macro species will be will be available then and then it, obviously in July Pretty much every, everything everything is out but flies are really really super for practice and flies are out now um you know flies you can find you can even find them on windy days as well hanging about on fence posts um and then the thing is with flies as well they are pretty small so if you can if you can manage to do handheld stacks of stack shots of flies um you know you're going to be really really set Tracy, yet yeah, once um, this is going to finish in about thirteen minutes, and then you will be able to um, you will be able to watch this from the from the beginning as well. And Caroline, have I photo stacked all of these? Um, pretty pretty much all of them. Yeah, yeah. I am I am a bit of a I am a bit of a stacker. Um, and you know, the more time you spend with stuff as well, the more times you're going to sort of see them doing pretty unusual behaviour. So here I've got a fly which is. Um, which has blown a bubble and occasionally you will see flies blow these bubbles and suck them back in and it's them um it's them sort of aiding their digestion and yeah keep an eye out for cow pats early in the early in the season these flies come out really early and um, these yellow dung flies and they make awesome subjects but it does mean that you have to uh you have to lie down near cow pats to uh, to get the, get the pictures and here I thought I'd throw a few curveballs in as well. So this is a handheld stack, um, but this time I have used a flash. Uh, so this was in the cloud forest um, in Ecuador. I was lucky enough to get a trip in there um, the year before we've had this sort of lockdown year. And what an amazing place the, um, the, the cloud forest is. But the cloud forest is pretty dark. Um, and therefore I found I did actually have to use a flash there quite a few times um, because there just wasn't enough nap light. And you know, when you find a, a weevil, which is sort of got blue legs, rainbow colored sparkly cut things all over it, um, you know, the, um, the you, you, you've got to photograph it. Guys, I am getting a few questions which are coming up um, sort of multiple times. And I am running a little bit low on time, so I'm, you you will be able to sort of go back and um, you sort of rewatch the video. So some of those I'm gonna um, I, I'm gonna just sort of keep cracking on with. Uh, but do I diffuse the flash? Yeah, I, absolutely. But um, I, the very short answer I do, um, and I use um, again diffusion paper, baking paper sort of does it, but. Uh, you could spend an hour literally talking about diffusing flashes and i always shoot in raw um, well nearly always but, but, but definitely 99 percent of the time i do shoot in raw but there are advantages to doing some of this work in jpeg as well because your camera won't hit its buffer as quick um, and the images will be easier to they'll be easier to edit you know if you're doing a big stack um, and some of my stacks could be could sometimes just be two or three shots and some of them could be 50 shots again it's very situational but the the, the computer requires a lot of processing um, and here I, I, this, is, this is a super rare lizard that i photographed in ecuador uh, proboscis and um, i probably might be the only person in the world who's done a handheld stacked image of a proboscis and early lizard um, but yeah really crazy looking lizard and here, this is another one I found in Ecuador, this, uh, this weevil. Um, I, I, actually, I did this one both with flash and without flash. Um, 
uh, just because it, it, it allowed me to get both of those and it was such an unusual find this this um this this, this weevil i wanted to get as much photography it actually I, I managed to get about five minutes worth of photography with it and then it opened its back and these wings came out and they and the thing flew away so where do I go now with this? So, you know, um, I've shown you a lot of my work. I've talked about the evolution of it. So, you know, I I, I, I went out and I got myself a, a, an R5 last, last autumn. And that is allowing me to do a few more things because I can shoot it on higher ISOs. It's faster. They're 45 megapixel files, so I can crop harder. But one of the things I'm going to work on this year is going to be around reflections. So here you've got me reflected um, on a raindrop, which is on a dragonfly's head, um, and you can see, you know, clearly see me waving there above the lens. And that that that's something I'm going to work on. I've also got these crazy video ideas how I'm going to get things. Um, I'm going to do things flying in from a wide angle, going all the way to five times magnification. And I'm really going to work on my high magnification videos as well. But I mean, the R5, I mean, you see the resolution on this, um, this, this, um, this butterfly. I mean, it's, the resolution is, um, is, is absolutely crazy. So these were all ones done with the R5. And of course, with the R5, I can do slow motion video. I can do 8K. Um, So this that's the um the the other advantage of going out early doors um you know when if you're there when things do wake up you've got this opportunity of, of doing videos um so my standard walk around macro kit list um you know i've been using the 5d mark IV for quite some years now but i'm now using the uh, the r5 much more um the Canon EF 100mm f 2.8L macro lens, had that for years, um, brilliant. Mine is a little bit battered now because I've used it so much. Um, and then the Canon MPE 65 is, an, is a, an, another one that I've used loads. Um, and then yeah, I have a full set of extension tubes. My Benro Mac 3 carbon fiber tripod has been brilliant, really sturdy, light and a good price. Um, and I've been using this Enduro five-way head because it, 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 it's really um, it's it, it's it, it's really good for being precise. Sadly, uh, discontinued now. Um, and then Macro Rail, I've been using this Nova Flex Castell L, um, Canon Remote Release, Wimberley, the plant piece, um, and also three-legged stool. That is um, that has been critical. Uh, Stuart, uh, no, I've never actually used um, any filters at all when I'm uh, when I'm doing macro work. So general tips, um, I've got just five minutes left. I'm going to go through these really quickly just in case there's more questions. Uh, field craft is just as important. Finding the subjects, respecting the environment so we don't damage it. And what I would recommend is just finding some local patches and going there a lot. You know, thinking about how the weather forecast has an impact and how different times of day and different years, uh, how those species come out. And learn how the species behave and, you know, don't, don't scare them. And the key to getting better with all this is just practice, 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 practice. It's, you know, macro is quite tricky. I've tried to give you a whole load of information here in a short period of time. Um, and I'm going to, you know, we've just got six minutes left, guys. Um, so I'm going to pass over to you guys for if you've got any questions. There, there is going to be a little bit of a delay um, in how I see the questions pop through. So how a process would have needed to have been a full um, additional one in itself. So there are various different bits of software you can use. Um, I use Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, a lot of people don't think that's a good combination for stacking, but I, I, I do find that quite good. Um, but what I would do, Tracy, is just check out some of my YouTube videos and I go through the full sort of process from finding the um, finding the the insects to doing the stack as well and sort of in a similar way to this you, you'll sort of see my view of Lightroom um, with me talking in the top right corner um, okay any other questions oh Nigel yeah I mean 60 mil is 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 good I I have just recently bought a 35 mil um, 
wide angle um, uh, macro lens, the new Canon, um, the, the new Canon uh, 35mm um, macro lens for the mirrorless system. And I'm really looking forward to doing some different stuff this year, sort of wider angle macro, which isn't something I've done much of. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Cliff, do you use camera on or off flash when I use it? I, I actually, I use the macro twin light, which clips to the front um, uh, when, I, when I'm doing it. Uh, David, yeah, I will be starting to run some more workshops when um, when things change. I, I'm also looking at um, a one-to-one -one product as well. Um, just You could sign on to my mailing list on my website. Um, yeah, or, or find me on any of these social medias is a good one. Uh, Stuart, there's a good video of Oliver doing that. Ah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Thanks, everybody, for coming to this one. Um, yeah. Any more questions, guys? If budget restricted, what kit lenses with extension tubes do you recommend? I, I mean, really, I'd, I'd go with whatever you've got. You know, so if you've got like an eighteen fifty five on a on a um, on, on a smaller SLR, um, yeah, I would just you know get some extension tubes. Um, yeah, that that would be the way I would do it. Um, the questions are coming through back too fast for me to answer them. Um, I, 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 I have another appointment at one o'clock, guys, but what I will try and do is later on tonight, I'll, I'll come back and have a look in and see if there's any questions that I didn't answer. Um, but, you know, feel free to find me on social media or drop me an email via my website. Um, is there a way of finding out which insects come out at which time of year? Yeah, I tr I, I've tried to do a little bit of that through the video. Um but um, yeah, I mean, again, you know, c c come and find me, but everything is starting to come out now, basically. Um, and, you know, most species are going to be out till September, but some dragonflies are, are, are a lot later and some butterflies are a lot later. But I mean, I, I, the two weekends ago, I actually saw three butterflies that weekend. Uh, uh, some really nice feedback here, guys. That is, um, that is great. Um, thank you very much. But yeah, if you there's some really good websites out there as well. If you want to find out more information about um, about insects, I mean, if you just Google um, any of the insects' names, there's there's various websites which um, um, tell you lots of detail about the insects in terms of feeding habits and what time of day, um, you know, and also distribution because you, you've got a different distribution of insects down south um, than um, than the Midlands and up north, etc. Uh, yeah, yeah the, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, like, there's a species of robber fly called a, a hornet robber fly that I've never seen um, and we don't get them up north um, and they can be found in sort of southern Wales and quite a few areas around the south coast, etc. Um, one of my goals this year is to, um, is to photograph those guys because they're, like they're like a giant robber fly. They're much bigger than the ones we get up here. So I've got a couple of minutes, guys. So if any more questions pop through... Ah, but yeah, what a lovely, engaging audience, guys. So hopefully I will be doing some more of these type of talks as the, uh, as the year goes on. Um, so yeah, hopefully see you, see you at something else. I'm oh, feeling almost a bit teary seeing some of this feedback come through. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Brilliant. Well, I have not seen any more. So... Uh, yeah, Darren, that is very good advice. You know, that's what one of the key things I have found is, you know, get out there and shoot. And the, uh, the, 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 the more of this photography you do, the better you get at it. So, guys, I am going to finish off from there. Um, thank you very much for, um, for, for coming to the talk. And, you know, hopefully see and meet some of you um, of, at some other time. Brilliant. Thank you, guys.